I like the fact that it's that there is a traceability there that they can ask the question. You know, customers can ask the question and they say, you know, who's caught this fish? And people are starting to um, ask those sort of questions, you know, where has it been caught and who's catching it? And I feel like that's the way the industry's going um, and I feel like that's the way it needs to go. You know, I want this here for my kids, you know, and hopefully one day it's still there for, for my kids' kids as well, you know. This is the Fish Tales podcast. I'm John Sussman. Good fishermen tend to be very observant of their surroundings, the weather and the environment. They see how things tie together and make connections that the less astute fishermen usually miss. The more you notice things, the better. Good fishermen tend to be adaptable. They are willing and able to change locations, tactics, gear and bait as the situation calls for it and are well practiced in many tactics and techniques of fishing. Good fishermen understand their prey and their prey's seasonal habits. In particular, they understand that location is far more important than choice of lure. A good fisherman will tend to want to know where and how you caught a fish rather than what with. The New South Wales wild harvest commercial fishing industry is a dynamic network of skilled but mostly small operators. The New South Wales fishing industry is primarily made up of family businesses that rely on high levels of local knowledge and skills learned over many generations. For Luke Buchholz, turning his passion into a profession didn't come with generations of experience in commercial fishing. Part of the emerging next generation of fishermen who are focused on quality over quantity, Luke's approach has been to work closely with his chef customers, both learning from them and helping them to better understand the opportunistic nature of wild-caught seafood. My family and I, we, we were um, born in Lithgow in the Blue Mountains um, and then Every school holidays, we'd come to, to Southwest Rocks. And my, my father had been coming here since he was a kid. Um, my grandfather had been coming since he was a kid. And we would always have our family holidays up here. And, and every chance we got, um, you know, we were fishing. My pop used to take me fishing all the time. Um, my dad used to take me fishing. And, and Southwest Rocks back in those days was a dirt road in, a dirt road out. And it was predominantly... Um, a, a fishing village so that that was what was done here you know and my my pop was probably the biggest driver um, for my love of the ocean and my love of fishing um, he's he's passed away now but he uh, that was he he lived and breathed it he he used to any chance he used to get he used to drive up um, drive up from Lithgow um, you know which back in those days would have been a 13 14 hour trip um, you know, just for a long weekend, so we could go, you know, fishing for dew on the wall, and and you know, our, our holidays, our family holidays, was then based around Selfish Rocks. And then when I was six years old, my parents bought a hotel in Kempsey, um, and we moved up from the from the cooler climate. Um, and yeah, basically, I went to school up here, and and uh, we were always around the ocean. My brother and I, we were, um, you know, into our sport a lot, and and we were. Uh, being in swimming and we did triathlons and surfing and and then it was just yeah it was really just natural progression we went from from the fishing and and i got really heavily into spear fishing there for a long time uh once i sort of left school um i was i was living up on the gold coast at that stage and and i I used to dive I, i sort of know the waters basically from from Port Macquarie through to Cairns, I've dived most headlands and, and you know a lot of the Great Barrier Reef and, and Morton Island and Stradbroke and yeah, so the, the the love started for me when I was really young and, and definitely came from my pop and my, my my father and yeah, it's something that you know I'll, I'll I'll be passing on to my kids. Luke comes from a family born in the bush but with a love of the ocean. With a grandfather and father, both manic recreational fishermen, the seed was sown that would become the driving force behind Luke's ultimate move into professional fishing. I've been fishing for commercially for about five years now. Um, so I'm not like, I guess, one of these other uh, family, uh, you know, multi-generation fishermen. Um, but I've always been interested in fishing. Uh, I did a lot of spear fishing when I was younger. Um, and then just, I guess, slowly came to the commercial fishing industry uh, by chance. 
We started out as as lobster fishermen. Um, so my brother um, was working on a lobster fishing boat. Uh, there was an opportunity to come up to to buy his uh, the business and and the boat. Um, so my brother called me. Said, "Look, this is what I'm planning on doing." And I was an electrician at the time. I'd been um, doing fly and fly out work for probably about twelve years at the time, and I'd sort of had enough and was looking for a bit of a change myself. And and being, you know, always sort of growing up around the ocean and and loving fishing and spear fishing and stuff like that, I, I was, you know, quite keen to give it a go. So I moved from Melbourne back up to South Shocks, back to my sort of hometown where I grew up, and. And yeah, we started we started lobster fishing, um, and then a series of things sort of unrolled with that business that allowed us to, well, basically stopped us from uh, fishing lobsters. We couldn't afford to buy the license itself. So, um, and then natural progression, we we started line, uh, fish trap trapping fish, and then. Um, we moved into sort of the more sustainable side of, of line court, which is what we only do now. The ocean trap and line fishery of the New South Wales north coast is one of the most important commercial fisheries in the state. With a vast number of species from the migratory pelagic such as tuna, mackerel, mahi-mahi, kingfish and bonito, to the seasonal snapper, mowong, silver trevally, tailor and leather jackets, the range is as diverse as can be found on the coast. Weather, market demand and water temperature impact the species Luke will be catching, making his business truly a reflection of the season. Everything's seasonal. Um, we're kind of lucky in that where we live, um, we get everything. So, I mean, in the warmer months, we're, we're lucky uh, in that uh, we get everything from, you know, your Spanish mackerel and, and spotted mackerel through your wahoo and dolphin fish, all these sort of... Uh, different types of tuna and uh, the winter months we get, uh, we sort of target snapper, mulloway, tailor, kingfish. Um, the water cools off a little bit. Uh, we still get the odd bonito uh, from time to time, but yeah, we, we get a good good range of uh, species here, um, you know, throughout the year. Despite increased pressure on small fishermen, including the expansion of marine parks, rising fuel and operating costs and increased competition from imports, Luke's business continues to boom as his customers of leading chefs and restaurants enjoy both his quality and direct supply. Long hours, working by himself and managing all aspects from maintaining the boat to selling and delivering the fish makes the job of the artisan fisherman truly a labour of love. A normal work day would sort of start with me getting up at about anywhere between 4.30 and 5 o'clock. Um, and now I, most of the time I work alone. Um, I've got a small boat, it's only four and a half metres that I um, that we launch around here. We can launch off the beach or uh, we use, we've got a few boat ramps in here that we use. And Yeah, we'll, I'll head out in the morning um, and, and go and target, you know, whatever's seasonal at the time and then I'll come home and pack fish um, if I've caught anything and then I sort of start the process um, contacting different chefs up and down the coast, um, depending on where. Oh, if I have enough fish, I, I usually try to do a run up to the Gold Coast. Uh, we've got a series of probably 10 or 12 restaurants that we deal with up there. Um, but, yeah, I, I contact them individually and they put their orders in. Uh, and then if the weather's good, I'll fish in the afternoon, uh, weather permitting. Uh, the next day, depending on the delivery day, I'll, I'll pack fish probably early in the morning around three o'clock and and then we hop in the car and either myself my wife or my my brother will will drive up and down the coast to to do our deliveries and then yeah that's basically basically start again the next day despite the long-held belief in popular media that every chef enjoys a direct and symbiotic relationship with a posse of seafood catchers and growers the truth is mostly the opposite the pressure of running a profitable hospitality business demands chefs to be on top of their costs and have a broad market appeal. This can be fundamentally at odds with the supply of wild seafood from a small artisan producer, from initially selling through the local cooperative to the larger auction houses of the city-based wholesalers, Luke felt he needed to engage more directly with artisan chefs who would appreciate the work that he puts into producing the quality he does. 
Social media delivers both the catcher and the cook direct access to each other. Being able to engage with each other takes patience and passion. It sort of was natural progression. We, I started selling, you know, uh, we, we started moving stuff down to Sydney fish markets uh, ourselves. Um, and then I started dealing with the, a few of the bigger people down there, the, the DeCostis and, and um, uh, the Poulos brothers and stuff like that. Uh, and then through social media, chefs started uh, reaching out directly to us. Um, and basically for us, it's, it's yeah, progressed that way. And now really that's how I sell most of our fish. Probably 90% is sold directly to restaurants. Um, and it's taken time to, to obviously get that sort of um, – the customer base built up, um, and but yeah, we 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 try to to limit what we send to the floor as much as possible. When when they sort of call me and ask me how I work, you know, the first thing that I explain to them is like, we only have two fishermen in our fleet. Um, it's basically myself and my brother, and and we're doing everything. Which you know, we're doing the packing. We're doing the deliveries uh, ourselves. So when they contact me, the first thing I explain to them is that, look, guys, we're you know we're only small fry here, and and we don't catch a lot of fish. We're not the best fishermen out there, and, and I'm first to admit that. Um, but you know what we do catch, and 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 what we sell, I believe, is is a premium product, and we put so much time into looking after our fish. Um, and look, 90% of chefs have been really, really responsive to that. And, um, they've been really flexible with, um, you know, their orders and stuff and they understand, they get it. Um, I think nowadays there seems to be a change in, you know, with chefs having set menus with, um, you know, selected fish and stuff, you know, they realize that they just can't do that anymore. Um, and the way to to do that for them to be flexible is to to run you know like the special board and and whatever's seasonal you know and it works really well with us because it's really hard being um, you know a small time operator trying to provide just one type of fish but you know when I first started that people were really picky in the whole like the class as well they only wanted large or they'd only want mediums or smalls you know and and for us we might only catch 40 or 50 kilos a day um and of that i might have every class you know so it's really hard to 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 give someone a something off the shelf so to speak if that makes sense so um but yeah 90 percent of chefs have been really 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 helpful um and responsive to what we do they deal with me directly. They're not dealing with anyone else. Um, every every chef has my mobile number. So if there's ever an issue or if there's anything we can do better, they always give me a heads up and, and I'm more than – and, you know, like I don't know anything. I, I haven't been in the industry for, um, for that long. Um, so, yeah, we're, we're very open to, to their suggestions. Um, we seem to be getting it right, I believe. Um, and it's now it's more – I think our biggest issue at the moment is, is catching enough fish for the supply. Uh, we definitely have the demand there. <laughs> we just can't keep up with it. Just as social media can provide direct conduit between catcher and cook, so too it can provide a platform of aspiration and motivation for younger chefs, fascinated by what the opinion makers in the industry can provide. For Luke, Josh Nylon, Wonderkin Seafood Chef, provided such a platform and gave the guidance and motivation for Luke to take the entire supply chain into his own hands. He was um, the first guy that really sort of reached out to me as a chef and said, look, you know, we, we, we want to take you guys on and, and try some of your product. And back in those days, we never did any of the transport ourselves. Um, so I was really – it was difficult for me to get product um, to Sydney quickly. Um, being so remote where I am, trucks only left on certain days and, and most of the time 
um, they'd sit in warehouses and then you'd have couriers that would have to go and pick it up and fish would get lost and get left in warehouses. And, and, and that's why I've taken the whole transport uh, side into my own hands. Um, and, you know, I've just bought another vehicle, which is now stuck in Sydney that I can't get to at the moment um, due to the current <laughs> lockdowns. But, um, yeah, so jo- Josh was the, the first guy that sort of uh, reached out to us and, mate, he's amazing. Um, the stuff that he does is, is just mind-blowing. And really from him, I would say that 90% of my other clients – have basically reached out through him through social media. Um, and, yeah, he's been the biggest platform for me. Um, and, yeah, it's oh, I, I, <laughs> I can't thank him enough for everything that he does uh, for me. Um, but, yeah, yeah, he's, he's, a, he's a genius. The small artisan fisherman is a true reflection of the skills of the hunter. With a deep, innate knowledge of local conditions by season, by tide and moon phase, it's just part of the job. Knowing what to target, what bait and fishing format is required, and what the market desire for a particular species might be, is all just in a day's work. So, depending on what we're targeting, um, for instance, if, you know, like this morning I was at Catching Taylor, um, so I, we're out driving around the headlands, um, basically flicking a hard body lure into the wash, casting repetitively until uh, until we're ready to go home or the tides tell us that we have to go home. Um, we, we sort of travel up and down the coast. Um, we sort of fish as far south as Port Macquarie and, and uh, as far north as Cross Harbour. Um, and so it just depends. Well, I do a lot of travelling. I've got a small boat and having a small boat it allows me to launch off the beach and, and um, yeah, pull back up off the beach, sometimes not so successfully. <laughs> More often than not, I end up getting stuck or I end up making a scene and most people get a good laugh at me on the, on the beach, stuck to the – sunk into the hilt. But, um, yeah, we, we travel up and down the coast uh, a lot. Um, and, you know, Taylor season is, is basically driving from headland to headland and, and, and spinning in the wash. Um, yeah, one one rod, one one lure, one cast, one fish. That's basically um, the nuts and bolts of it. The artisan fisher is by nature a sustainable operator. Catching across species and seasons ensures that what is taken from the ocean has a value on a plate somewhere. The problem is that sometimes this results in a species consumers may or may not have heard of or are reluctant to order from previous poor experiences. However, when the catcher, cook and customer align, a once lesser known species can become a true restaurant star. It's something that's really difficult to change and it's one fish that I really struggle to move um, purely because I don't think it's the chefs that uh, have an issue with trying to work with it. It's more the consumers. Um, A lot of people have that mindset, preconceived idea um, about Taylor and, you know, Taylor bean bait and, and so on. I personally think Taylor is one of the nicest fish in the ocean. My wife, it's my wife's favourite fish. And um, so, yeah, there are a few things. That's the few things we do struggle with. A lot of people do have um, preconceived ideas about certain fish. Uh, a lot of people want fish that don't take like, taste like fish, <laughs> like, pearl, <laughs> like pearl perch and snapper and stuff like that. And... Um, yeah, it's it's. I guess at the end of the day, it's more just educating people, and and but ninety percent of chefs are willing to give it a uh, are willing to give it a go. Um, it's just more their clientele. I find that any restaurant that's close to the ocean or in a fishing village, they won't touch it. it it's but the, the sort of the restaurants that are in cities and um, you know a, a bit more sort of inland, then yeah, they have no trouble. You know. I honestly thought when I first started fishing, I thought Benito uh, would have was going to be something like that. Um, but Benito has become one of the most highly demanded fish in the ocean for us. Like, um, yeah, we cannot catch enough of them. <laughs> to be honest, 
and the demand there is is huge and and I'm guilty of having that preconceived idea myself you know I, I always grew up using what we used to call them leddies um I remember my pop fishing on a uh fishing with a couple of his mates that were commercial guys here in town and they used to fill 44 gallon drums with them and I remember pop freezing them down and they were the best snapper bait you could find um <laughs> But yeah, now it's it's you look at it, it's it's crazy. It's one of the highest. I think it must be one of the highest averaging fish on on the market for today, um, year round. Fishing is a primal endeavour. We've been doing it as a species for thousands of years in one form or another. So in the big picture, there really shouldn't be any confusion as for why people love the thrill of the hunt as much as they do. Many non-hunters think that people hunt or fish because of some out-of-control bloodthirst. Serious fishermen know this couldn't be further from the truth. The fishing community generally has a very strong connection with nature, including the animals that they pursue. This manifests itself in real respect for the environment and the seafood they hunt, from understanding it, stalking it, killing it, and then utilising as much of it as possible and being thankful the whole time. Every day is different, you know, and and that's the best thing about it. You know, I don't know what I'm going to catch until I've caught it. And and there's something exciting about that that still to this day that just I get so excited. I don't get sick of catching fish. Um, And, I I mean, I'm sure there's people out there that would, but for me it's I still get just as excited to catch, you know, a a mulloway or or a big tailor or, or, you know, a big snapper. It it excites me as much as it did the first day that I started fishing with my pot. <laughs> and and look, that that's what brings me back every day. And some days it's it's average. Look, oh, we work out of really small boats, and you know, ninety percent of the time I come home wet. You know, and you know, it can blow up or it rains, or I can just get wet travelling from A to B. Um, so yeah, those days where you, you know you, you catch no fish and and you know you. you your copper flogging, so to speak. Those days are the ones where you sort of just got to come home and and reset and and uh, yeah, get up the next day and and give it another crack. Luke Buchholz is a reflection that the seafood industry has a bright, exciting, and sustainable future. A true star of the sea. This is the Fish Tales podcast. A Deep in the Weeds production. I'm John Sussman. Stay tuned for more tales from beneath the surface of the seafood world.